Thank you, Arthur. Um, yeah, so if, for those of you who don't know who I am, um, I, I, I do a little bit of journalism, but the, the day job's an engineer, that, that's what pays the rent. I do some journalism, I do some commentary, and I'm speaking about things from a Christian perspective, because that's the only way I can speak, because that is my perspective. It's uh, uh, an understanding of the world that is comprehensive. It allows you to see things in a different way and see things in a new way. And once you've realized that and had access to that, it's the only way to analyze events. It's the only way to speak about the world. So I try to do a little bit of that, and I try not to get it horribly wrong. And I try to give as much truth as I have managed to discover. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, it's at Albion underscore Rover. Now, a couple of things. One, the football name, the football team of the same name is not thrilled that I got that one first. Um, they, they did complain. They said, we don't want you using this because you're talking about all these things that are controversial and uh, we don't want you using the name. So, well, I've been Albion underscore Rover for longer than you have. But the reason is... When I was a small boy, my older brother took me to see football from age three. And we were, the house was halfway between Adrianian's ground at Broomfield and Albion Rover's ground. Right? But, but Broomfield had a wall around the pitch and I couldn't see over. That's how little I was. But Rover's had a fence and I could see the men on the pitch. So age three, I was an Albion Rover's fan. So I told them this, this, this lovely little story thinking they'd go, oh, you're okay. And they blocked me. So there you go. Um, but it's Albion underscore Rover for a reason, right? Because Albion means British and Rover means wanderer. And another name for wanderer is Scott. And the Hebrew words Sukkot, very similar, which means temporary dwelling, is related to that. So we are wanderers and we've been in many places. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. So let me see if... That clicks it. Right, okay. Now, um, this is confession time. This is the first time I've ever done a talk in a church. So, make, allow make allowances. Um, a, a, a Christian economist and historian called Gary North gave novice pastors advice. And the advice was, start with a text. Hope you're listening, Arthur. I know you're not novice. Stick to the text. Get to the point. Call them to commit and give them legitimate hope. That was the advice, right? Which seemed okay. So anyway, I'm going to see how far I can get along those lines. So I'm going to start with the text. And the text is the declaration of our growth. This describes who we are and where we came from. And as you know, this was written uh, to the Pope to pro proclaim independence for Scotland and independence for the Scottish Church and give reasons why we are a nation and we shouldn't be subsumed under English rule at that particular point. So the bit that's very relevant to the who we are is this, which reads, this is a translation from the Latin from the uh, Declaration of a Broth. Most Holy Father and Lord, we know, and from the chronicles and books of the ancients, we find that amongst other famous nations, our own, the Scots, has been graced with widespread renown. There is no cringe in this. There's a cringe in the country now, but there wasn't. They journeyed from greater Scythia, so that's our origin, it's Scythian, more on that in a moment, by way of the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Pillars of Hercules and dwelt for a long course of time in Iberia amongst the most savage tribes, but nowhere could they be subdued by any race however barbarous. Thence they came 1,200 years after the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea to their home in the west where they still live today. It's significant that the point that they used as reference was when Israel crossed the Red Sea. So that's written in 1320, referring to ancient chronicles. So this goes way back. Right, so we came by way of the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Pillars of Hercules. So, just to be clear what that is, oops, 
There we go. Tyrrhenian Sea. So this is one, one of the bits of the Mediterranean. So we came along the Mediterranean. Um, so this is the bit between basically uh, the Italian, Sicilian, and Sardinian coasts. And the next point that they mention is the Pillars of Hercules. And if you don't know, that is, that's the Straits of Gibraltar. So you've got uh, the Strait of Gibraltar on the European side, and there's mountains on the African side in Morocco. And those are the Pillars of Hercules. And then they went into the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, and then to Ireland, and then to Dalriada, which is Argyllshire, and that's how they came to Scotland. So this gives a definitive historical support to the general movement of peoples from Scythia, Greater Scythia, to Northwest Europe. And that, that, it's not just the British Isles, but it covers British Isles, the north coast of Europe, Scandinavia. Right? And the names move and the peoples move. In Britain, we've got the Saxons are Scythian. If you go back one or two editions in the Encyclopedia uh, Britannica, I think it, it, it clearly states that. When they dig up Saxon burial grounds and hordes of, of uh, you know, gold jewellery and, go and, 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 and gold ornaments, they're Scythian ornaments. The Picts, which were here when the Scots arrived, the Honourable Bede, um, writing very early, said that his access to ancient information and ancient manuscripts said the Picts were Scythian. So all the different bits of the nation all come from the Scythians. So that's the, that's the origin. Um, the, 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 the suggestion from Malcolm that we were a mishmash of different peoples that have come in, yes and no. It, they've come, we've come from different areas. Jutes, Angles, Saxons, Vikings, Scots, the whole lot. But all of those people are the same people. They're all Scythian. So one of the remarkable things is you have people moving across Europe by different means, you know, around the back of the Caspian Sea or up through, um, up through uh, the Balkans or along the Mediterranean and moving around very extensively. The degree to which people moved is way more than they're moving now. I mean, they, 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 the, 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 they were moving into largely empty lands and they were moving as whole peoples. Uh, so these various tribes moved through and you ended up with them all congregating northwest Europe, particularly the British Isles, and particularly Scotland. Now, um, this has... This has... Um, this can be uh, identified in the data that's relating to uh, the genetics. Genetics is a, a science with a troubled past, but it's now getting very interesting. It's, it's shedding a huge amount of light on where we came from, not just as a nation, but where we came from as a people, and how closely interrelated we are. And if you... It, it's surprised many of the geneticists. It's not surprised anyone who's read the Bible who understands that you had... Um, Noah and his sons and the sons' wives, only, you know, a relatively small number of thousands of years ago. The, the, the dates are maybe open to some debate, but let's say 5,000 years ago, that was it. That was the point zero for humanity. Now, genetics initially claimed a completely different origin story for humanity and put forward that we came out of Africa and it was hundreds of millions of years. And then, when they got, when the science of genetics moved on a little bit and more data was available, all of a sudden, that was shown not to be the case. So genetic study is now, like so many branches of science, the cutting edge of genetic study is backing up, is catching up with scripture. Right? And this shows that we're very similar, right? There's not many races of men, there's one race of man, mankind. Right? That, that, that we are all very closely interrelated, and we should remember that. Now, in the British Isles, 
Um, in the British Isles, we've got... Oops, wrong way. Beg your pardon. Uh, a genetic study that show that. So the first thing is, the British people are very genetically similar. The whole lot of them. Because although it's all these different um, moves, um, invasions or... Um, or, or movements of people into the country from the Vikings, from the Jutes, from the Angles, from the Saxons, from the Scots, they're all very similar because they're all Scythian stock. So that's one thing that comes out very clearly from the genetic study. We're all very similar. But it does pick up um, the slight differences as well because you do have different tribal groups coming in. So there are distinctions. And this map shows what the, the, this, this research found in terms of the distinctions. The red bit, that's basically the Saxons. And you'll see that the rest of it, the, the, what you might term the Celtic fringe, is actually very varied. And there's, there's lots of different tribes coming in to, to that area. Hence, Scotland's been called Britain in miniature because the, the mix of peoples that made up the Scots is really a very similar to the mix of peoples that made up Britain as a whole. And that article, oh, wrong way again, living and learning. That article is from Nature. So this is a, a, a top-level scientific journal, and it's called Fine-Scale Genetic Structure of the British Population. So this is uh, information that we can back up um, scientifically as well. Now, um, so my, my point is that, this, that, that we are quite clearly Scythian, and the Scythians came, let me just flip back a wee bit, the Scythians came from the far end of the Mediterranean and from the area north of Syria and Iran, that's where they came from. So they came from the areas where Israel was taken when they went into captivity. And they were related, incidentally, to the Carthaginians. They spoke the same language. Carthaginians, Phoenicians, Bithians, Scythians all spoke the same language because when Hannibal could no longer fight the Romans, from a Carthaginian standpoint, he went to join the, his, his, another people who spoke the same tongue, who were the Bithians, who were still warring with the Romans and fought them there because he was very keen on fighting Romans. Now... Um, a couple of things on symbols. Oh, let me try and get that right. There you go. Right, so this is Edinburgh Castle. So I, I, I've been travelling to Jerusalem for many years, since about 98. And I've got some friends over there who are Jewish, and they come from an Orthodox Jewish family, and every stereotype you've ever seen about the, Jewish, the Orthodox Jewish family, it's all true. Right, so the, 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 the mother is a Jewish mother, and she's lovely. I mean, she's a beautiful person. She loves her kids. I love her dearly. She is the, author, she is the stereotypical Jewish mother, right? And, uh, and, and the, the father's a, he's now retired, but he's a very well-educated man, a rabbi, he teaches at the university. So it's very interesting people to talk to. And two of the kids were coming over. So one of the kids and their husband was coming over to Britain. And they were going to London, they were coming to Edinburgh. Oh, you come to Edinburgh, I'll show you around. So we met up and we went to, we went to Edinburgh Castle. And uh, as I went in to Edinburgh Castle, I pointed up at that. And I said, what's that? So this, this girl who had never been out of, I think she'd been to America once. She'd never been out of Israel apart from one trip. She's grown up in Jerusalem. She looked at that and said, that's the line of Judah. I said, correct. For 10 extra points, what's it doing in a Scottish castle? And her face was quite a picture. Now, she knows this is the line of Judah, obviously. Uh, let me give you another notable building. That is um, the municipal buildings in Jerusalem. Uh, built quite recently. Quite a nice building, modern architecture. Um, built with Jerusalem sandstone cladding because that's a British planning restriction. Right? From the time of the mandate, we thought we've got to keep Jerusalem looking nice. So there was a rule put in that all buildings must be built in or clad in Jerusalem stone, which is a limestone. 
So that's, uh, you have British planning law to thank for that. Um, and on the front face, that's a symbol. So that's a symbol of Jerusalem, which is also the line of Judah. And it's basically identical. And there are many, many symbols which translate across from Israel to uh, the, the, the West European countries, particularly those of the British Isles. Um, another thing which I've put in just to please Arthur, the Stone of Destiny. Right Now, there are many viewpoints on how genuine this is. The, the story, legend, um, and how much is correct, I, everyone will have a different view on. But this, the legend is, this was taken by Jeremiah with the king's daughters. After, after Judah had been invaded and the king was taken away into captivity, all his sons were killed, his eyes were put out, and he died in captivity. And that was the end of the kingly line. That was the end of the line of David as kings ruling over any part of the children of Israel. But God had said there would always be a king, queen, ruling over Israel without a break. So, um, Jeremiah disappears off in biblical history. He goes to Egypt. He's got a scribe. He's got the stone of destiny. And he's got the king's daughters. And up in the annals of Ireland pop this chap from the east with a scribe, with a stone, and with uh, princesses from the east. So that takes you to Ireland. The kings of Ireland were, were crowned on the stone. The stone was then moved to Dalriada, and the kings of Dalriada were crowned on it, and then it moved to Schoon, and the kings of Scotland were, st were crowned on it. And then it was stolen by Edward I and taken down to England. Whether they got the right one, I'm not entirely sure because there was a case where the Scots were offered it back at one point and said, nah, you're all right. So that makes me think that that could be a lump of scoon sandstone, which only begs the question, where's the real one? But it, this stone came to Scotland and was revered and we crowned our kings on it. This was no joke. This was serious business. And it was held by the people who were crowned to be the stone that was spoken of in the 28th chapter of Genesis, which I'll read to you. It says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, Arthur told me that this intricate infill of a former service conduit in stone is known in the church as Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's ladder. So that's lovely. Uh, uh, Genesis continues, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac and the land whereon thou liest. Uh, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The second bit, it's clear in the New Testament refers to Christ. There's two promises here. One is a national promise, huge numbers, power, colonizing nation, never fulfilled by the Jews. The other is the promise of Christ, which was fulfilled in the Jewish nation. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest, and I will bring thee again to this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So this is a promise right back in Genesis that God will not leave our nation. And he keeps his promises. Now, um, before we go on to more scripture, um, the information I'm giving here is not new. So just over 300 years ago, a uh, French church scholar and Huguenot refugee, Dr. Jack Abadi, wrote a book titled The Triumph, the Triumph of Providence. And he stated, quote, 
Unless the ten tribes of Israel are flown into the air or sunk into the earth, they must be those ten Gothic tribes that entered Europe in the 5th century BC and founded the nations of modern Europe. So I'm not, this is not coming from me. I didn't originate any of this information. This has been widely discussed, believed by the royal family, certainly at one point, widely discussed in Britain, and as you see there from some time before, uh, in, in Protestant Huguenot circles, they read the scripture, they looked at the promises, they looked at history, and they said, well, this must be who we are. Now, I want to just f finish with some quotes from, from scripture about what God says to our nation. Uh, so, he says, try that again. No, not moving. Oops. That's the one. He says in Jeremiah 16, Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that it shall be no more said, The Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and all the lands whether he had driven them, and I will bring them again into the land that I gave to their fathers. So this is a view of a second exodus. So this is a view that although Israel is dispersed, moved through all nations, not a single, the, the analogy in the Bible is it's like grain being sieved and not a single seed is allowed to fall to the ground. No one's lost. God knows who his people are in terms of the descendants of Israel and those who have joined them. Um, this is reinforced by the next one, which I have here for you. Uh, and it shall come to pass in that day, this is from Isaiah. So come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people. Uh, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathos, from the Cush, from Elam, from Shinon, from Hamath, and from the Isles of the Sea. And, he's, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and so shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So one of the principles here is there are two nations, Judah and Israel. They're separate. They're separate until, jo until God rejoins them when Christ returns. Right. They became separate. I'm a bit of a libertarian. I rather love this. It's not that Israel was right, but they had a point. Uh, it was a tax revolt. Right. They became separate when Solomon was taxing uh, the life out of uh, all the children of Israel. When he died and his son came, uh, uh, the, the, the people said, look, if you just reduce the taxation a bit, we'll serve you as we served your father. And... Um, he spoke to his old advisors, and they said, well, to be fair, the taxation is a bit heavy. Uh, I think we should do what they say. And he spoke to his young advisors, and they said, you're twice the man your father was. Tax him more. So he liked that advice better, put the tax rate, taxation up, and Israel said, to your tents, O Israel, and left. Right? And he was left with his own tribe, Judah, and one, one other one, Benjamin, and everyone else departed. Right? And they formed a separate nation. The separate nation was called Israel. So you had the house or kingdom of Judah and the house or kingdom of Israel. There were two nations. And when Christ returns, they'll be reunited. But not before. So you've got here uh, a prophecy about both the outcasts of Israel and the dispersed of Judah. It always talks about Judah as though scattered and dispersed. And it talks about Israel as displaced and moved out, but not not scattered to the four winds in the same way. Right. Um, Jeremiah, and uh, Jeremiah 31, it says, again speaking of, of Israel, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth. Uh, and, with them the, uh, and with them the blind and lame, the women with child and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. So this is everyone coming. It's always saying, I'm going to bring them from the north. 
So from, from a, a, a biblical point of view, a Jerusalem-centered point of view, right, they're coming from the north. And I said, they shall come with weeping and with supplications, and I will lead them, and I'll cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, and wherein they shall not stumble. For I am father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Ephraim was, this, was the younger son of Joseph. But in God's eyes, he's the firstborn. He gets the, 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 the inheritance, the position of the firstborn. Jeremiah continues, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. Do you notice how it's always isles? And say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. A quick um, segue. Uh, I, I, I used to do bits of journalism, and I never spoke publicly on matters of religion. And then when COVID hit, I was invited to do a talk outside Parliament in one of the protests. And it was on a Saturday, and I keep the Sabbath. And I said to them, oh, I keep the Sabbath. I'll do your talk. I'm happy to do your talk, but I'm going to talk about God. Is that what you want? And they said, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> we'll get back to you. So I thought, well, this will be interesting. So I got a message the next day. We've had a vote. I thought, oh, this is even more interesting. It's 11 to 0. You're in. So... <laughs> So I got invited to talk to this entirely secular crowd protesting rightly against the lockdown. Um, and that was the first time, uh, that, was the first time uh, that I ever spoke on matters of religion. And this, the theme there was, my theme there was Lord God Almighty is sovereign. And I was invited back to do another one and that was actually cancelled by the police and I did it on my own outside the, the bridges at Queen's Ferry and recorded it. And the theme of that was um, that, that Christ is our judge. And then I got invited back to do another one, and Arthur was at that one as well. And the theme there was uh, Thy Kingdom Come. And I got one more of these I got asked to do, and everyone was talking during COVID. They were saying, don't be sheep. You, you, meaning don't do what the government says. Don't be sheep. And I'm thinking, no, 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 we are sheep. That's, that, that's not the problem. <laughs> The problem is we're following the wrong shepherd. So, so my last one was, um, you know, was, was to follow the shepherd. You know, we like sheep have gone astray. I would have to say that some of the audience wasn't, wasn't down with that, but that was my message. Uh, so, now, a couple more uh, quotes here. When we're talking about salvation, there's a lot of confusion, and I haven't time to go into the, all the detail of this just now, but there's a lot of confusion between the role of Israel and the role of the church. Right? And I think it's much more unified than, than most people understand. Um, that salvation involves both. Um, and uh, in Isaiah it says, Listen, O Isles, again, O Isles, listen, O Isles, unto me, and hearken, you people, from the far. The Lord hath called me from the womb and from the bowels of my mother, has made mention of my name, and said to me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Right? So there's a role for Israel that's, that's very central to, to the plan for salvation. It's God's plan, it's God's salvation. He's redeeming us, but we have a part to play. In Hosea it says, again of the number, of, it says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in that place when I said to him, you are not my people. Because after Israel had done its tax revolt, that wasn't really a problem. The problem was they revolted against God. They revolted against the proper worship of God and they took on pagan and false worship. Right, it's similar in many ways to sort of pagan and false worship that we now call woke. They took on all of this. That was a problem. And God had had enough and said, you're not my people, I divorce you. So he says here, in the place that said to them, you are not my people, they that should be said unto them, you are the sons of the living God. That's the future for our nation. Whether they know it or not, and whatever it takes to bring them to that will happen. But that's the future for our nation. And then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel, note it's two, 
be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. The one head is a, is a, is a reincarnated David. So this is all future. This is when Christ returns. This has nothing to do with modern day politics. Um, last one now. So in Ezekiel it says, and David my servant shall be king over them. All right? So this is, this is God's doing. Right? Um, and they shall have one shepherd and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Now, we, we, if you take on the fact that we're Israel and you read the Bible and you look at what Israel was like and you look at our nation, it's the same. Maybe that's a humanity thing. But the, God did wonders and carried them out of, out of servitude and slavery into the desert to go to the promised land. And they did nothing but whine. Right? It was one complaint after another. That, that's familiar to me. I look at my nation and think, yeah, we'd do that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Manna again? Come on. You know. We would do that. That's what we're like. And we have the ability to serve God as a, as a national trait, but we have the ability and the tendency to backslide. And by here, there's been backsliding going on in this country aplenty. So Ezekiel continues, and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and the children's children forever. And my servant David shall be prince forever. So this is, we're talking about the millennium and beyond. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I shall place them and multiply them, and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yes, I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's us. That's the Scots. Not only the Scots, but that's the Scots. All the nations of the earth, the people who are called to Christ now, whatever nation they come from, are adopted into Israel. So that's them too. That's why it's, when Paul said, it's the Jew first and also the Gentile, because Everyone who believes is, spiritually speaking, an Israelite. They're in God's family. They are in a position where they are saying um, that... Hang on, let me get the right, right one there. Yeah, uh, it's not... It's, uh, yes, yes, I will be the God and they shall be my people. We are in that position. Um, one final thing before I finish, and this is the problem of phone, because as I picked up the phone, it immediately turned off the page which I'd prepared it to, and it's given me instead an advert. That's nice. Fortunately, I can remember. Um, in Revelation, when it's talking about the new Jerusalem coming down to heaven, coming down from heaven, there are 12 gates with 12 angels, and in each gate there's a name, and it's one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the Israel as a whole is hugely part of it, so that text also shows. And also, underneath that city, there are 12 foundations upon which are written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So on an even more foundational level, it's the gospel. It's built on the gospel, but Israel is a huge part of the structure. And our nation has to embrace the gospel and has to answer its call. It will do. It's just a matter of when. Because as in so many things with Christ, the battle's already won. It's up to us to do what's, what we're called to do. It's not up to us to worry about eventual victory. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.